Hello. Thank you for joining me on this fine Halloween evening to discuss neuroplasticity and spinal cord injury rehabilitation. Feel free to sit back and relax and enjoy this spooky adventure down this topic. As I've already posted a more in-depth and specific handout on LMS. I'll begin by discussing the prognosis and that it is dependent upon many factors as we already know through discussion in class. Specifically the level of injury, extent of the injury, um, as well as any psychosocial support system that the individual may have access to or may not have access to, and any musculoskeletal impairments that were pre-existing or comorbidities that may have been pre-existing. One factor that we have yet to discuss in class is neuroplasticity and how to facilitate it specifically to provide the most optimal functional recovery in patients that have experienced a spinal cord injury. Next I'll define neuroplasticity. From looking at various different sources, I've been able to determine that it is best defined as the ability of a neuron or nervous system to adapt after injury, as well as during normal growth. So you can look at neuroplasticity as being synonymous with neural modifiability or, um, like I said, adaptation or the ability to adapt. Um, and this adaptation or this modification occurs in three different ways. The first being collateral sprouting, so we're all familiar with how the intact axons after an injury can um, sprout or grow new axon terminals to then increase the uh, strength of the signal propagation down to the um, destination, hopefully. Um, Secondly, neuroplasticity is achieved through an increased in neurotransmitter release presynaptically as well as increased receptor sensitivity uh, postsynaptically. So these three things are done in hopes of increasing the efficiency with which a nervous system works. Um, one main issue with neuroplasticity and one problem that people um, have with applying it to the spinal cord is that glial scarring does occur in the central nervous system after injury and this is done via um, production of chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan chains and these chains actually physically block the collateral sprouting from um, being efficient or effective whatsoever so um, that is one of the reasons why people think that there is a, an inability within the central nervous system to develop any type of function after injury when in reality um, studies have shown that it is plastic and it can modify itself after injury. Um, and I'll discuss on the next slide specifically how, how these things are addressed. I did hope to discuss some of the research being performed in animal subjects and how that is applicable to humans or how it is hypothesized to be applicable to humans but unfortunately I do not have enough time to do that so I will refer you to my handout next in humans um, what is being done specifically to help facilitate neuroplasticity um, I've laid out three options that I found in my literature search and I'll be describing them all. Um, I'll begin with activity-based restorative therapy. Um, here it is a very, very, very intense therapy program, usually um, lasting for up to five hours per day. Um, but in order to be considered activity-based restorative therapy, it has to have five different aspects within the plan of care. Those include weight-bearing activity in as much um, of the extremities as possible, functional electrical stimulation, task-specific practice, so rather than just teaching bed mobility and uh, transferring mobility, um, being incredibly specific to more than 
that type of function. So if the patient was, say, a male carrier prior to their injury, gearing treatment to hopefully get them to be able to do something like that um, in the future. Whether or not that's possible yet, research is inconclusive, but with investigating neuroplasticity further and further, it is looking to become more promising. But back to the activity-based restorative therapy, we have the weight-bearing activity, functional electrical stimulation, task-specific practice, mass practice, so just providing the patient with as many opportunities to practice the skill as possible, as well as locomotor training with or without uh, body weight support on a treadmill, and then external neuromuscular facilitation techniques, um, targeting motor and sensory uh, aspects of the patient above and below the injury. Um, and studies have shown that this type of approach is beneficial, but very time consuming and um, could be a financial burden on the patient, um, specifically because of the hours required to show the treatment. So, um, as physical therapists, we'll need to become creative with occupational therapists as well as possibly other exercise professionals to provide patient centered care. Next, I'll discuss the functional electrical stimulation and electromagnetic stimulation. This, in my literature search, has shown to be the most um, upcoming or, or most most new type of modality, um, specifically because there was not much research out there for it, but it is an option to use uh, functional electrical stim as well as electromagnetic stimulation to help produce a step-like pattern in patients, human patients, and it's been done, um, but the magnitude of muscle contraction was not enough for them to be able to bear weight through it, so more research has to be done on this uh, combination of modalities to be able to have a clinical ap applicability. And lastly, robotics. So to discuss robotics, I'll need to first define it, and um, for this presentation I'll define it as essentially just smart exoskeletons applied to specifically the lower extremities of a patient that is uh, or participating in rehab, gait training, um, after their spinal cord injury. Um, multiple different studies have been done on multiple different types of patients that um, are trying to regain as much much function as possible. Um, so I'll quote uh, some of the findings that I think are specifically important in trying to facilitate this neuroplasticity, specifically trying to stimulate the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, cyclic AMP, to be able to provide as much collateral sprouting for the individual as possible. Um, one study showed that in working with individuals that had motor complete spinal cord injury um, that 45 minutes per day, five days per week for a total of 45 sessions um, was able to restore the soleus H reflex um, which is huge if the patient has no motor control below the level then restoring a reflex to help potentially restore some function is is fantastic. Um, another study investigated robot assisted gait training. Um, so it's been um, shown to provide statistically significant improvement in gait parameters of people with incomplete spinal cord injuries. Um, specifically uh, the parameters used in this study were three times weekly for 40 minutes per session the group that received the robot assisted gait training and then conventional gait training was twice a day five days per week for four weeks um, both showed increases not one was more than the other um, so this study is just showing that using robot assistance to help facilitate gait could be a good option for specific patients that may may require it um, there has been one systematic review published that investigated 15 case studies um, in using robotics to help facilitate gait, and um, the majority of the particip participants in this systematic review were um, suffering from Asia 
A or B classification spinal cord injury at the thoracic level, uh, ranging from C4 to L1. Um, and the time since their injury was uh, highly, highly different. It, it varied a lot. So some, the range was between two months and 24 years. So some of the research is showing that um, benefits in gait parameters can be achieved regardless of what, um, how long the injury, how, how, how old the injury was, how long ago the injury had occurred. So that is definitely a benefit of robotic therapy. Um, one company that I have pictured here, the Locomat uh, out of Switzerland, is able to sense how, where the individual's center of mass is. And with a shift to the right, the orthoses or the, um, robot, the robotic orthoses would then initiate a left swing phase. So um, it's highly, highly sensitive to changes in the patient's body as well as initiating, it, uh, very effective in initiating the movement to get them to be able to participate in gait training. Um, one other study investigated uh, hybrid assistive limit exoskeleton, so the one pictured on the screen currently, um, and a different type of feedback, which I will get to on the next slide. So what is the best type of feedback that can be given to a patient trying to relearn how to walk after a spinal cord injury? Um, well, the research is slightly inconclusive on this, but um, the typical verbal and visual feedback could be applicable depending on the patient's preferred style of learning. Um, as well as other types of tactile feedback that actually have been investigated in more recent li literature using that hybrid assistive limb exoskeleton as pictured in the previous slide. Um, researchers examined uh, what one session of gait training for 90 minutes would do to a patient um, and what they uh, did specifically is use the body weight supported treadmill in addition to those exoskeleton orthoses on their legs, but programmed the orthoses to provide a resistive torque that was 10% of their maximum uh, voluntary isometric contraction. So the orthoses were actually resisting the motion of gait. This is, uh, the theory behind this is similar to the PNF quick stretch technique. So uh, recruiting the patient's neuromuscular system to help provide an increase in torque production. Um, and uh, results from the study were actually really good, uh, suggesting that plasticity is possible even after one session in humans. Um, researchers found that there was an increased functional connectivity strength in the motor cortex via fMRI, as well as increased somatosensory excitability and corticospinal excitability. Um, like I said, just even after one training session. So uh, further, further studies need to investigate this type of uh, feedback in teaching patients with spinal cord injury to ambulate, uh, restoring that ability in them, um, but this one study at least is promising for this type of feedback. And that wraps it up for my presentation on neuroplasticity and how to facilitate it in spinal cord injury rehabilitation. Uh, as stated previously, please refer to the more in-depth handout uh, for more specific information as well as for the citations of all of the research that I was discussing tonight. Thanks for listening and have a happy Halloween.